to the introduction to the groundwater flow model. My name is Sawyer Treese. I am a water conservation assistant for the city of Glendale. Um, in the previous video, we talked about pore space and porosity, and we conducted an experiment to demonstrate that concept. In this video, we're going to introduce different concepts in the groundwater flow model. That way we can understand them better before we put them into action later. Um, so what comes to your mind when you think of groundwater? What is that? Uh, and yes, it is the water that is underground. But more specifically, it is the water that's in the pore space between different particles of soils and rocks. Um, so if you remember from our porosity experiment, which is a spoiler now if you haven't watched it, the gravel had much larger pore space. It was much more porous. It had higher porosity than the sand. Therefore, the water could flow much easier through it. And that is one of the many concepts that goes on in this groundwater flow model. Um, this is a representation of what it might look like to drill down 200 feet underground. Although there are places in Arizona that dig a thousand feet underground. Um, and the rocks and soils in here and those concepts, it would be a lot easier to understand if we take a closer look. Alrighty, what is this first layer here? It is gravel. It has the largest sized particles, the biggest pore space, and it is the most permeable or porous layer in our model. What about this second layer? This is our sand. It has medium-sized particles, medium pore space, and is less permeable or porous than gravel. Both gravel and sand serve as permeable layers where water can freely pass. Lastly, what might that third deepest layer be? This is clay. It has the tiniest particles with virtually no pore space. So we call it an impermeable layer, meaning little to no water passes through. It is important to remember that all of these particles can be found in the ground mixed together, or they can be found separately in different layers like this model shows. Let's look at the surface water source. Where do you think that might be? Surface water is the water above the surface of the land. In this particular model, our surface water source is the lake. Next, we have our pumping wells. These are the wells we use to pump water to the surface. In the model, they have the little boxes at the end of them. By comparison, the injection wells are over there, and they are the wells where we can pump water back into the ground. And lastly, let's look at the groundwater units, the sand aquifer and the gravel aquifer. Aquifers are underground permeable rock formations that hold the groundwater we want to pump. But what do you think this layer between the sand and gravel aquifer is? This is the confining layer made of clay, which if you recall is impermeable, meaning little to no water passes through. The artisan aquifer is confined by this layer of clay. So how does this water make its way underground? Well, it's the same reason why I'm not floating around in this library. It's because of gravity. Gravity is the force that pulls everything towards its center, including water. So when we're watering our plants, some of that water is absorbed by the plants, some of it is lost to the atmosphere, and some of it percolates or moves downwards through porous materials by gravity. Cities take advantage of this concept in order to recharge their groundwater supplies. You could think of it kind of like a piggy bank, where when we want money, we withdraw it just like we would pump water from the ground. Whereas when we want to save money, we recharge it or we deposit it. Um, in Glendale, about 5% of our water portfolio is made up of groundwater. Uh, 
thank you for watching this introduction to the groundwater flow model. Hopefully a little background information on these concepts gives you a better way to understand its demonstration in the next video.